It may seem hard to believe, but in the vacuum of uncertain geopolitics between World War I and World War II, U.S. military planners deemed it prudent to plan for an invasion of Canada. The Joint Army and Navy Basic War Plan Red was one of several color-coded contingency war plans created in the 1920s and 1930s. War Plan Red hypothesized that the British Empire may have wanted to act on a limited window of naval superiority to invade the United States. As a countermove, the U.S. planned to take the fight to the British by invading Canada to prevent its use as a springboard for ground and air attacks. The idea was even updated to allow the use of chemical weapons against America's friendly neighbor. Canada, for its part, also developed a plan to defeat America, a precaution motivated by its own fear of invasion. Suspicions regarding a U.S. attempt to annex Canadian territory as it had done almost a century before with Texas were high. Defense scheme number one called for a preemptive strike against the U.S.'s northern border designed to occupy U.S. military resources until reinforcements could arrive from Britain. Canada and the United States have not always been close allies. The animosity between the two nations predates independent Canada. Back in 1812, Canadian colonial troops burned down the White House. The messy war, which neither won but both states claimed to have won, was the spark of a low flaming candle that burned for years. People from both nations bickered and fought at the border over tree lines and farm animals. These petty fights often received amusing names such as the Lumberjack War. Throughout the brief conflict, lasting from 1838 to 1839, each side fought for the right to cut down the trees between Maine and New Brunswick. The U.S. Congress sent 50,000 men to defend the American trees, forcing British Chancellor of the Exchequer Baron Ashburton to negotiate the borderline with Secretary of State Daniel Webster. Maine's territory was extended as a result. In 1859, the Pig War began over an argument regarding the value of a Canadian pig shot by an American in his potato garden in San Juan Island. The problem escalated into a naval intimidation attempt. The USS Massachusetts and 500 Americans were pitted against 2,000 British troops with five warships. Although the governor of Vancouver ordered the destruction of the American ship, Royal Navy Rear Admiral Robert Baines refused. Both sides stepped down after Baines remarked, quote, to engage two great nations in a war over a squabble about a pig would be foolish. A real military conflict was avoided thanks to one man. Tensions between Canada and the U.S. would continue all the way up to World War I. In 1861, two Confederate diplomats on the way to the U.K. were arrested aboard a British vessel. Lincoln sent troops to the Canadian border under the pretense that Britain was supporting the Confederates rather than remaining neutral. The British accused the U.S. for orchestrating the situation to annex Canadian territory. Although the British theory was more credible, the intensity of the American Civil War forced Lincoln to focus on his home front. When Canada became independent, it feared that the U.S. would try to invade, taking advantage of the new country and its lack of military. The British promised defense in case of an American attack until 1899, when Canada assembled an official army of its own. World War I changed the face of war for every Western nation. The United States came out on top, with Europe weakened. America was a superpower, and as such, fear towards its imperialist pursuits captured the Canadian imagination once again. In 1919, fresh off the fears and pain of World War I, the Canadian military chose to assess their ability to fight a war on the home front. They asked war hero James Sutherland Brown, commonly known as Buster Brown, to design a strategy for fighting the United States of America and leading to Canadian victory despite their scarce population. Disguised, Brown entered the U.S. through the New York and Vermont borders, armed with only a Kodak camera to conduct reconnaissance efforts. He took note of many details, some of which would probably be useless in the actual event of a war. One of his remarks noted, quote, If Americans are not actually lazy, they have a very deliberate way of working and apparently believe in frequent rests and gossip. In 1921, as a direct result of his undercover mission, 
Brown laid out his offensive action plan titled Defense Scheme No. 1. The scheme would have sent field troops from the Pacific Command to take over Spokane and Portland, following the Columbia River. The Prairie Command would march towards Fargo in North Dakota, with another line moving towards Minneapolis and St. Paul. Their advance would cut off the Port of Duluth on Lake Superior and protect railway movement from Kenora in Canada and along the Rainy River. As for the Great Lakes Command, Canada would keep most of them on the defensive while launching raids across the borders in Niagara, St. Clair, Detroit, and St. Mary's. The Canadians would launch an attack on both sides of the Adirondack Mountain Range through their Quebec Command, which would converge near Albany. Finally, the Maritime Command would attack Maine. In the years between the two global wars, the U.S. military sought different ways of keeping its officers sharp and engaged. While the world misplaced hope in the League of Nations set up by Woodrow Wilson, America turned to isolationism and strategic planning. During that time, experts feared Britain could launch an attack on the U.S. to maintain dominance in the light of growing American power under the excuse of obtaining loans repayment. In particular, officials feared the threat Canada's proximity represented, for the U.K. could have accessed American soil through its colony. Between 1920 and 1930, the U.S. War Department commissioned an invasion plan against Canada to be executed by the Joint Army and Navy Board. Americans considered Canada's defensive positions as the main targets. The U.S. Joint Planning Committee, which would one day become the Joint Chiefs of Staff, developed several war plans based on potential adversaries. War Plan Black detailed an attack on Germany. War Plan Orange detailed an attack on Japan. Finally, War Plan Red described war tactics against the British Empire on its Canadian front. The Americans assumed that going to war with the British meant a long-lasting conflict. Therefore, taking over Canada was more of an initial step. Seizing the bordering colony would eliminate the threat of inroad soldiers and munitions, while stalling the British Empire by dividing its forces and diverting their focus. War Plan Red called for strategic bombing of the Halifax port, and conquering all ports the British could use in Canada. The Army and Navy would move on Halifax, and troops would attack the power plants at Niagara Falls. Immediately after, the U.S. would launch its invasion on three fronts. Each front was meant to take over a key Canadian territory. The Vermont Front would lead to the conquest of Montreal and Quebec. The front at North Dakota would lead to the defeat of Winnipeg. The final front, from the Midwest, would let the U.S. take Ontario and its valuable nickel mines. Meanwhile, the Navy would attack the Great Lakes while blockading all ports. The plan did not call for any strikes outside of the Western Hemisphere. Conquering Canada was meant to force the British Empire to the table so peace could be negotiated. In that scenario, the U.S. hoped to retain some or much of Canada's habitable territory. The plan did not detail how to act if Canada claimed to be neutral during a confrontation with the British. It was decided, however, that a neutrality claim would only be accepted if the Canadians allowed the U.S. to occupy ports and strategic areas until the conflict's end. The plan did not call for attacks on British ships or any other sort of attempt to fight the Royal Navy. This followed the conclusions drawn during the war games of the Naval War College. If the British fleet crossed the Atlantic, it would then be engaged to halt trade. War Plan Red did not stay in its original state forever. In 1935, Congress invested $57 million on an update. This included the authorization to use chemical weapons against Canadians. The plan now had permission from Congress, saying, quote, make all necessary preparations for the use of chemical warfare from the outbreak of the war. The use of chemical warfare, including toxic agents, from the inception of hostilities is authorized. Alterations also included the construction of three fake civilian airports along the Canadian border, in case the U.S. needed to fight Canadian fighters and bombers. These supposed private airports were air bases that would serve as both a line of air defense and as a launching spot for possible future bombings. This later addition also changed the roads for the potential invasion, stating, for example, that, quote, the best practicable route to Vancouver is via Route 99. The American plan did not intend to return any gained territory to the British Empire after the battle was over. 
In fact, the updated plan explicitly read, quote, The policy will be to prepare the provinces and territories of Crimson and Red to become states and territories of the Blue Union upon the declaration of peace. The reason for this has been contested. Some historians believe that the policy was adopted because American generals thought Britain would not return any territory if it successfully invaded part of the United States. Others believe that the plan was part of Americans' expansionist and imperialist goals. Unfortunately for all of the American officials involved, the government printing office mistakenly published the plans in a brochure, which the New York Times picked up as front page news for May 1st, 1935. At around the same time, the U.S. was conducting its largest war games at Fort Drum by the Canadian border, with around 36,000 troops. President Roosevelt was left with an immediate, although short-lived, diplomatic nightmare and media frenzy. The plan was thrown out in 1939, with the military strategizing focusing on Europe instead. Despite the brief period of paranoia and suspicion, the US and Canada would become allies sooner rather than later, as the fault lines of a new world order began to establish themselves in the lead up to World War II. In Canada, Buster Brown's successor burned most of the details and plans of defense scheme number one. In America, the attack proposal war plan read gathered dust, along with other government plans and documents that went unused. It would not be until 1974 that the plan would be declassified and rediscovered by a Canadian journalist. Thank you.